Uh, okay, so I am going to try to find, I think I saved this file. Maybe not. Oh, yep, I did. Yeah, so this was the file that we were basically working with last week. And when we went, we, we ran our check layer to actually match color, this is the thing that we ended up with. And you can see it's a very subtle thing. Uh, I'm turning this just on and off right now. So this is on. It puts a little bit more warmth and brown into this image. That's with it off. It's a little bit colder in here. But because we're trying to actually match the, 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 the woods and all that kind of stuff, that's what we were trying to do. I'm going to turn the check layer on for color just so that you can see what it was that we actually did. So again, this is how this check layer works. It really accentuates the difference in color between the background and the figure. So this is without the color correction put on and this is with it put on. And you can see in doing this kind of work, whatever, we end up matching the background and the, for, uh, the figure in the background a little bit better. Even though um, both of them had a color neutral card in it and both of them were neutral color, um, this is moving away from that. This is actually pulling these things even tighter together because it's creating <clears throat> even though because they had extremely very 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 radically different palettes um, it's bringing them much closer together um, and in the end the consequence in my opinion anyway and I'm fairly certain you guys would agree is that it feels more in place she seems more in this space with this warmer color added to it than she does without however that's a very, very, very subtle thing. I mean, look at this. I'm turning it off and then I'm turning it back on. That's a very, very, very subtle correction. And it works really well in the method that we've got. However, what I want to show you guys now is something that I've worked on to figure out, develop, using a lot of people's information, a lot of stuff from other people, whatever. But I've ended up coming up with this way to do extreme color correction. And that's what we're going to actually look at right now. Things that would be too difficult to do just using a color balance uh, adjustment layer. So I'm going to close this guy up. I'm going to actually ask you guys to open up a file for me. I need everybody to go through this. We're going to do, there's a couple of files to open. So if we go back to our session um, nine, Inside your session nine, there is a folder called Pix Imperfect Composite. And if you click on that inside, there are two files in there. One is called Lady in Red, and the other is called Night Street. If you can select both of them and open both of them into Photoshop. Again, if you don't get this warning, you've got something wrong, you need to let me know. And so it's two files. One is a street scene. Uh, I'm going to go with Italy. It could be France. Anyway, I'm going to go with Eastern Europe, old school. And then another of a girl in a red dress standing on some railroad tracks. Does everybody have these two files? Are we good on this part? Okay, really quickly while you're at it, if you can jump into your browser really fast. I'm just going to do a brand new window and I'm going to type in Pix Imperfect. P-I-X-I-M. P-E-R-F-E-C-T, and actually go to that. You'll notice that the very top hit is a YouTube channel that is called Pix Imperfect. This is channel run by, I can never pronounce this guy's name, so I apologize for that. I'm not even going to try. Um, uh, Umish Dinda. Anyway, I apologize for butchering that name. Um, these are his files. Um, he does a very, very close version of what we're going to do here in terms of color matching. He does it in a different way in terms of how he sources his colors. But nonetheless, um, this is one of the few people that I actually um, have bookmarked. And I, I, if you are looking for sources of good, solid, not good, really, really solidly good 
uh, information on doing uh, anything in Photoshop, whatever, this should be one of your top sites. Again, I've already told you guys, there's three people that I really care about on YouTube. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, um, uh, Photoshop training channel with Jesus Ramirez is the second one. Um, and then, um, uh, why can I never remember his name? Flern, who's the guy at Flern? P H L E A R N. Yep, Aaron Nace, Ed Flern. Those are the three. So at any rate, uh, I give credit where credit is due. Um, uh, and so anyway, that's where these files have come from. And that's again uh, the method that he uses to actually do this color correction was a jumping off point for me, although I've taken it um, in a radically different direction. So um, just so that you know. Anyway, in addition to this, there is a PDF that exists inside your folder. So it's going to be inside your student folder for week number nine, and it is called Extreme Color Matching Methods. It's a PDF. If you open this thing up, this is what I do. There are a lot of steps in this, but it is a way for us to get the color palette of one image and apply it as the color palette, the color mapping to another image. So, Jim, when you talk about wanting to do uh, color grading, this is all the elements that you would really, pro not all, a lot of the elements that you would want to probably consider in doing color grading are going to get covered in what we're going to do right now. Uh, so it's not just for Gemma, this is for all of you guys, but so that's kind of the road we're going down. But I'm telling you right now that this is an incredibly complex thing to do. So that's kind of where we're going to go through. Um, I don't do this every day. So I open up this PDF and I follow the steps in the PDF. Again, a lot of them I know, um, but um, again, I will check myself every now and then. So I want you to open up that PDF because in that PDF is a link to an Adobe place that will allow us to analyze an image to bring its, uh, to, to try to grab its color palette. So if you open up the Extreme Color Matching Methods uh, um, uh, PDF, you will see at the very top, there's actually, you should know about this before we get into this too deep, there's two methods that exist in here. The first one I think is more precise, but it involves more steps. If you continue through this, if you go down further, further, further down into this, you will actually get a second method, gradient map GIF method. There's a second method that's um, more abbreviated. Again, I don't think it's as precise as the initial one, so I just wanted you to make you aware of that. We are going to do the more precise version of it. Um, if you want to explore the other one on your own, you're welcome to do that. Again, it's really explicit. But the first thing I need you to do is you need to get to this link. It's an Adobe website. It used to be called Color. They spelled it with a K. Did anybody ever work with Adobe Color? K-U-L-O-R, L-R-L-E-R? Yeah, well, anyway, they've changed it because it was a stupid name. But at any rate, if you click on this thing, again, it's the link that says right here, coloradobe.com uh, forward slash something, blah, 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 blah. Um, at this stage of the game, once you get there, the first thing you need to do is log in. So you need to, to log in. Let me go back. Let me start that all over. To log in, you need to go up to the very top. It's that weird little icon that's at the very top all the way uh, to the side. Um, it's not actually... They've changed this. Oh, no, where it just says sign in. <laughs> Hello. Where it says sign in at the very top, you need to do that first. If you don't, there are things here we can't get to. So it just takes your regular sign in that you would actually use. So I'm going to just click on mine as continue. Uh, again, we are on, <clears throat> if it shows you personal account or company, yours is a company account because it's all done here through uh, the school. And then once this happens, then all of the things that, are, that we need to have access to are available to us. So everybody got signed in, no problem. Uh, okay, 
So the next thing we are going to do is come over to make sure you clicked on, you'll see there's tabs at the very top. You want to click on the create tab. And again, I'm just going to sort of follow this part. The next thing you want to do is there's a set of tabs underneath the word that says Adobe Color. There's Color Wheel and then there's Extract Theme. You want to click on Extract Theme. And then we need to drag the image that we want to get our theme, our color palette from. And it is the background that we just opened up. So, say what? I try to open it again. Yeah, reload it from the beginning. Yeah, it just opened me up like I already logged into my baby. You still need to log in. Oh, you are. Okay, okay, that part's fine. Click on image and now go back to color. I still think this is going to work. So, uh, yeah, because you're going to click on image because I feel like we'll see. So, go ahead and click on image. Say what? It's just extract gradient, right? No, it's extract theme. You guys are doing this in Safari. Are you doing it in Safari? Yeah. Is anybody else in Safari and having this issue? Don't see this. Say what? And you don't have it either. Hang on. Say what? Yeah, I'm going to try it right now. I still got mine as extract theme. All right, let's just check the top. So when you guys look at the, um, yeah, this isn't going to help me here. Hang on one second. You got this without the same I'm sorry, what? You got this without the sending in Chrome. It what? Oh, it goes in Chrome. So I need you guys to actually open that link in either Chrome or Firefox, not in Safari. So to do that, go back to your PDF. Simply select that link. Copy it and then go to either Firefox or Chrome and paste it in to the top and then load it and tell me if you get extract theme. It's gotta be a Safari issue. Bree, did that work for you? Did it work for you? Oh, it already worked for you? Okay, Jobella, did that work for you? Oh. Sorry. Bree, did that work for you? Not yet. Oh, okay. Got it. I will wait.
You can, what you can do is you can get all the color information, whether you can then bring that into whatever other program you're looking for, I don't know, but you can certainly write down all the color information and get the exact color. Yes? You could, although this typically, it's, you'll see. So ask me that question after we go through this. Great. How's it going? Oh yeah, Chrome is going to want to run your life. You haven't even downloaded it yet. I did though. Oh, all right. Is it running? Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Why does it keep opening? Do I need to like... It's, you've got your default set, so you need to copy this mm -hmm. link. Just take it in there. Yep. Joe Bell, does it work for you then? Yeah. Okay, so clearly that's what it was. Okay. Bree, tell me when you get it up, okay? Okay, okay. whoo! Is that wrong or what? I mean, what else are you missing in life because you're using a browser that they don't like? I don't know, whatever. Okay, so at any rate, you need to then navigate back to the original uh, don't try to do this from photoshop go back and find the original uh, night street picture the one that's actually in session number nine and simply grab that night street and drag it on top <coughs> of the window that was in um, adobe uh, what they're, now they're calling adobe color and what should happen is that it should actually load the image and then it, you should have a set of uh, little dots on here um, uh, and then a color swatch that sits up down at the bottom and a preview of your image that's up at the very top. Did everybody get that part? You may not get this. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop asking if everybody's got this. If something goes wrong, stop me before we take another step, okay? And then I don't have to keep asking. All right, so the trick to this is that if you take a look at it right now, you can see it sort of develop. It's looking at this image and it's picked color spots for you that it feels like sort of like function for the, you know, for, for, for basically the color part of this image. And when I look at this, this actually does a pretty good job of it. So what I'm looking for is what color are the shadows? What color are the highlights? What color are the midtones? Do I have a good range in here? Um, and this represents, I think, a relatively good range. It's not great, but it's a relatively good range. And the reason I say it's not necessarily great is that um, the darkest spot that's sitting up here, and I don't know if your screen ends up being exactly like mine, or your dots roughly the same as mine, same sort of pattern. It should be, because this is all Adobe. 
But the one that's up on the sky, it's a night sky, whatever, that's not really a, a, a viable color image for me. When I think about the shadows of this image, I think more about this area that's in the lower left-hand corner, seems more like a shadow color to me. So you can grab the little circle that's up in the sky and you can drag it down into the little small area that's sitting right down in the corner. That actually has got, the sky itself has got a blue tint to it that would never be in the image, but this shadow color that's down here actually would be in the image. So that seems to me to be a better color in this. Um, it's pretty far away from the other darker color that's over there. So anyway, that's how I basically would do this. The next thing that I do is I, I and this is, you don't have to do this, but I'm anal like this. Um, I like to have my color linear. And what that means is that right now I've got the darkest colors all the way on the left hand side and then I go to the lightest color. I want to go from dark to light. I don't have to do that, but that's how I want to do it. So for me, I'm going to click on the darkest color that I just changed. So it's the swatch that's all the way to the left. I'm going to click on it and I'm going to bring it all the way to the right and hopefully have it pop in on the right. And so that I've now got darkest going to lightest. We good? Okay, so I'm going to reorder those the way this part actually works. And that part is now going to work. So then uh, I'm going to come up to, right, I'm going to click on my library right here. So I'm going to click on... Do not click on libraries. Ugh, fuck me. I'm going to try that again just for practice. Uh, come over here to. Oh, so if you look over on the far right side, you'll see that there's a little preview of your um, color swatches. And then right underneath it, it says save to, and there's this AES. If you click on this drop down menu, you can change it from AES to my library. So click on that part. Then we actually need to name this thing and it already gives me a name. It's called Color Theme Night Street. I'm going to leave it at that because that's exactly what it is. If you wanted to give it a different name for a different reason because you had multiples of these, whatever, you can rename that part. But in this case, we're all right. And then you want to click on Save. So it says that the theme was successfully saved to my library. So now we're going to go to step number two, going up to the tabs that are at the very top that are in the black area where it said create was in the beginning, come across to where it says libraries and click on libraries. And in the libraries thing that actually comes, you will see that there is a drop down menu that says uh, my libraries. Click that to open it up, and your color theme should be sitting in there. Does everybody have that color theme in there? Are we good? Wait, you did what? All right, that part's good. That's your library, and just hit save. And it saved it and then click on libraries and then click open your library and that's it right there okay we're getting there guys i know this seems like a lot but trust me in the end you'll be shocked when you see what happens uh, okay so um so find your theme go ahead and click on it to actually make it active you'll get a big version of it so there were people in here who asked before can you use this in another program if you can, we're going to actually download this palette as a special file. If it's a file that is supported, that the Adobe support, so probably any of the Adobe applications this would work in, you can actually use that 
to uh, uh, bring this palette into whatever, if you're bringing it into Illustrator, whatever you're trying to bring it in. The other thing is that if not, if you take a look at these numbers, these weird set of numbers that are on here, these are hex numbers right here. So this is an F2E205. That describes this number in what they call hex. Hex is actually, um, it's a string of characters that they use to describe color. They use it to describe a lot of data, but the hex alphabet basically is A, A, B, B, C, oh wait, A, B, C, D, E, F, one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think. So anyway, that's the hex color. If you copy down this hex color, so for instance, I'm going to copy down this color really quickly just so that you know how to do this. It is an F2 E205. If you go into Photoshop, and click on your color picker, your foreground color picker. This is where your hex code is right here on the very bottom. Remember, we've talked about HSB, RGB, LAB, and CMYK. There's also this number right down here. This is the number that you would plug in for a hex code. So I'm going to plug in that exact number, F2E205, and that is the yellow that that color represents. And then you would just say OK to that, and you would have that color. Make sense? So anyway, that's what these colors are. Back to our version right here. Again. So you want to come over here onto the right-hand side. We want to download this, but you want to download the ASE. This stands for Adobe Something Exchange. So it's a, I forget what the S stands for, but anyway, it's an exchange file. You want to click on this to download it. And now typically what I do is you want to save this download file in a place that means something to you. So I'm going to put it in the folder that has my two image files with it. So I'm going to go to my session nine and I'm going to go to that Pix and Perfect folder and I'm going to save this ASE file to that folder so that I know where it is. Do you have this big version up on your screen? You're clicking on download as ASE, the first option on the top right. It opens up just a regular download window and you actually just get to pick where you want to download this. I'm putting it in a place that We good? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody else okay? Okie dokie. We're going back to Photoshop. Whew. So back in Photoshop, everybody good? Mm -hmm. Okay, back in Photoshop. There's a window that we don't use very much that we are going to use right now. So to get to it, uh, Okay, do you know where you saved the file? Yeah, I just dragged it to the folder because it, it comes up down here when I press download as. Yeah, as long as it's that ASC file. Okay. And you're going to find out right now whether it worked or not. So we need to bring that color swatch into Adobe Photoshop. And once we bring it in, it'll actually stay with us until we get rid of it. So the place where it's stored is what they call swatches. Now we don't keep the swatch window open in Photoshop because there's very little reason to actually do that part, but that's what we're gonna do right now. So to bring this in, come up to the window menu and then come down to swatches and it will actually open up a dialog box. Uh, um, it's a, actually a palette. And I'm going to drag mine to make mine larger. You'll notice that I've already got one version of this already in here, so I'm going to get rid of that version. So we need to actually then bring that file in. So everybody's got this thing open, right? Swatch is open. Okay, because this is going to be our exchange place. So what? Go to the Windows menu. 
Come down to swatches. Begins with an S. Are you good? And then it should have opened up a dialog box that probably doesn't look like mine, but it's got swatches at the very top. Are you good? Yeah. Okay. So there is a flyout menu across from the tab from swatches. You need to click on that flyout tab. It will give you a drop down menu. And you need to select import swatches. It's almost uh, two thirds of the way down. So take a look at my screen to see where I'm at. Click on the thing that says import swatches. A dialog box will open up and you need to navigate then to the file that we just saved five minutes ago. So again, I know where mine is because I put it in the folder along with the two image files. So it's in my session number nine inside my Pix and Perfect. And inside there is the Adobe Pix and Perfect whatever dot ASE file and click on open. <clears throat> when you do that, at the very bottom of your swatches, you should get a file that has the name on it. And if you click the little drop down menu, you have now got that color palette inside Adobe Photoshop. Has everybody got this part? That part worked out okay? No. Nope. Yep. ASE. Yeah, I, I just downloaded JPEG. Oh, then go back and download the ASE file. Yeah. Got it? Okay. So we're gonna i'm gonna close up swatches right now because we need to do other work about doing this putting this composite together first before we actually do the color grading part that's the last so i'm gonna just close it up it's there it's got all the names and the numbers in it we're good if we select the lady in red now so we're in photoshop you should have these two files in photoshop everybody good on that part so we're going to do the compositing part pretty quick if you look in the channels palette i've already built the selection for the girl to be knocked out so just go to the very bottom of the channels palette i've got the girl file that's the one that i'm working on go to the bottom of the channels palette hover over the thumbnail where it says knockout hold down your command key click and that will load it as a selection and then I'm actually going to add this as a layer mask to this selection. I'm also going to change this into a smart object because we are going to do some transforming with all of this. So to get this to be a smart object, again, when I actually added the layer mask, it unlocked the layer, it renamed it layer number zero. I'm fine with that, although I'm going to double click on it and call it uh, figure just so that I know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to change this into a smart object. There's a million ways to do that. I typically go up to the layer menu, down to smart objects, convert to smart object. And you'll see that when that happens, it actually embeds the, uh, 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 the uh, mask inside the smart object, which is great. This is what I really want to have happen because now I've got legitimate transparency around this. Um, if you double click on the smart object, you'll notice that it'll open back up and you've still got the file and you've actually got the, uh, uh, you've got the file with the, um, with the mask on it. The problem that you'll notice about this, though, is that this actually truncates things. It makes it as small as it can possibly be. It's no longer the whole size of this big image. It's actually this really small figure thing right here. That's something that I can leverage here as long as I don't feel like I'm going to need to transform her um, in some giant way, which I don't feel like I'm actually going to do. So I'm good with this part. You can simply close that up. 
we're going to take the smart object now and move it over to the night scene. So I'm going to just click on the layer of the smart object. Again, this is why I don't use tabbed behavior for my windows. I like to have them separate. If you've got all of these as tabs across the top, if you can remember and you're comfortable with dragging and dropping between tabs, go for it. For me, I prefer to have it this way. If you want it more like mine, tear your tabs off so that you've got separate windows. I'm just going to click on the layer of the figure and drag it over on top of the night scene. Hold down the shift key and let go. And it will bring the girl into the scene completely in, centered into the scene. That's what it's all about. Are we good on this? I'm going to go back to the original girl and close it up. I don't need it. I'm not going to save it. I don't need that work anymore. It's actually already done. So now I've got my figure in my scene. Everything is ready to sort of like work on here. So first things first on this is that I need to make a couple of adjustments in this. And the first one is I need to scale the girl to get her in perspective. Now, if you double, if we, I'm sorry, we should have, I'm don't, you don't need to do this. I'm going to do this really quick. Uh, actually, everybody do this. Everybody do this. We need to open up the girl again. So go up to your file menu, come down to open recent and pick lady in red and it'll bring the file open again. We need to find her vanishing point and the horizon line for her. So has everybody got the girl with the railroad tracks open again? Okay. I do it with the pen tool. You guys already know this, but I also do this on the pasteboard so that I can go beyond. So I'm going to hit the F key to get to the pasteboard. I'm going to hit the P key to get the pen tool. And then I'm going to trace the railroad tracks. So I'm going to do, I typically don't do the inside of a railroad track or any, any the inside of any of this. I would do the outside. So I'm going to click on the outside. I'm going to start with the rail on the left. And I'm just going to do a point so that I can trace the whole line. And again, if you don't see the rubber band part, this blue line, you're never going to be able to do this. To make sure that you can see the blue line, click on the gear of your pen tool and make sure that rubber band is checked. And then I can simply trace that line. I'm going to click one point. I'm going to then come back around and I'm just doing other points out onto the pasteboard so that I can get to the beginning of the other rail on the right hand side. Again, I'm going to trace the outside of that rail and I'm going to click on that. And you can see now where these two points intersect and they intersect basically at her forehead. If I pull down a guideline from my uh, um, uh, uh, rulers and put it right on the intersection of those two points, you can see they run right through her eyeballs. So her eyeballs are where the horizon line of this image is. So now I know that part. I can now close this image up. I don't need to save it. I know that the horizon line is her eyes. Makes sense to everybody? Okay, hit the F key to get out of here. F key one time will take you to the black pasteboard. F key again will get you back to the stoplights. Go ahead and close this image up. We don't need to save that. I just wanted to find out the horizon line for her. Back on to my composite now. I'm going to turn off the girl. I need to find the horizon line of my night scene. So I'm going to do the same trick. I'm going to hit the F key to get to the pasteboard. I'm going to hit the P key to get to the pen tool. And this gets to be tricky, some of the things that you pick lines that you want to trace. So I know, for instance, that the line that's going along the ground where the street is actually meeting the building, it curves. It actually, it, it's not a good line for me to pick as a horizon line. It's probably not level because, uh, again, it's a great going uphill. So what I do know that is in all likelihood level is going to be the bottom of the windows. That part I can pretty much guarantee guarantee would not be on an angle. Most, again, there's weird architecture out there, but when you think about it, most windowsills are level in, in no matter what the building, what kind of space the building is on. So even if the building is on a giant hill, the windows are level and that's the part that matters to us. So I'm going to start with the top window on the left and I'm going to do it on the ledge on the very top of the bottom window ledge. I'm going to click on that and I'm going to drag a line down so that it traces the window ledge 
and I'm going to click and say that's one point. And then I'm going to do the other two. There's two windows on the other side that are deeper in. They're past the door. Again, I don't trust the, um, uh, um, you can see there's a line where there's sort of plaster work is meeting stone work. Well, that could be level, but I don't know for sure that it's level, but I do know that the opening in the windows will be level. So I'm gonna click a point there in the top corner of that window. And then again, trace another line down so that it traces exactly the top edge of that window. And I'm gonna just click and add another point out here. Where these two intersect is my horizon line of the scene that we're dealing with. So I'm gonna click and drag a, a, a guideline down from my rulers. If you don't have your ruler showing, click on your view menu, come down and put a check mark by your rulers. And now you will be able to click on a ruler and drag a guideline, a non-printing guideline down to the intersection of those two converging lines. That is the horizon line of my night scene. How do I do what? Oh, I'm not making a curve. You don't, you're not clicking and dragging. Hit Command-Z, Command-Z, Command-Z. Go all the way back. Keep going. Good. Uh, you can turn her off. Click on this point up here. Let go. No, you're dragging. Don't do that. Okay. Hit Command-Z. Click once and let go. And then pull out a point here. Line it up so it runs along that line. Keep going down. Keep going down. You didn't pick a point up on the corner, so you're looking for that inside edge right there. Go up a little bit. You're looking at to drag just to be perfectly along that line. That's shooting way up. Go up. Keep going. You don't need to be anywhere that far down. Put your cursor right up in here. And just perfect right there. Click. Beautiful. Come out here. Click. Perfect, click, then come up to that corner. Click on that very corner, click. Come all the way over here, no dragging. Perfect, click again, because that was a perfect line. That is your horizon line. Is everybody good on this? We've got the horizon line for the street scene? Okay. Um, I don't want the path anymore, so I'm going to click on the path uh, palette, and I'm just going to throw the work path away. I don't need that anymore. I've got the horizon line. I know where it is, and that's what mattered to me. I'm going to go back to my layers. I'm actually going to hit the F key. I'm going to return all the way back. I hit the F key twice to return back to my image so that I've got the stoplights, and I've got all of my palettes, and I'm ready to go with this. I'm going to turn on the figure here, and I'm going to first thing I'm going to do is scale the figure to something that is in my scene that I know is actually true in my scene, and it's going to be the door. So I know where she needs to be. I don't want to see this horizon line right now. I'm going to use it in a minute, but I don't want to see it right now. So I'm going to hit Command H. That will actually hide it. If you hit Command H again, it will bring it back. That's true of all the non-printing things. So if you have marching ants and you hit Command H, they're hidden. Uh, hit Command H will bring them back. If you've got um, uh, uh, color sampler control points and hit Command H, it'll hide those. So anyway, it's just to hide things so that they're not in your way. So Command H will hide that. I need to scale the girl to the door right now. So again, she's a smart object, which is great. So I can do transforming smaller, larger, smaller, smaller, all that kind of stuff, whatever is non-destructive. So my first move is Command T to bring up the transform dialog box. And I am simply going to drag her over to the doorway. So I put her foot so it's like on the ledge of the door. I'm going to then click on the link up in the options palette between width and height so that when I scale her down, it scales in proportion. Again, you don't want to make her height smaller and leave her width unchanged. Otherwise, she becomes really wide and squat. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking to keep her in proportion. I also have got her feet on the ground at the door. If I just do my transform right now, it's going to make her head shorter and it's going to make her it's going to bring her head down in the image and her feet up which means I've got to then continually reposition her feet back on the threshold of the door. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to grab the anchor point, which is right in the middle of her, 
and I'm going to drag the anchor point down to the bottom of the transform dialog box where her feet will be. Now when I do the transform, the only thing, it will be all head down to that. Her feet won't move, but her head will. Do you not see the anchor point in the middle? Again, the check mark that's up right under the word that says Photoshop, there should be a check mark in that little box. If you go back to our session number one and go through those preference settings, you'll set, you can set a permanent version of this and not have this happen again. So at any rate, with the link checked between width and height, I'm simply going to grab on one corner and I'm going to make her smaller, about the size that I think she should actually be relative to this door. Now if you take a look at the door itself, I'm going to go ahead and say okay to just the transform that I did. It doesn't matter. I can do it again. But if we take a look at the door itself, there's a whole sort of like uh, um, uh, um, design curve element that's over the top. That's not the door. The door is this square part that's right here in the middle. And I need to then make sure that she sort of fits that. I'm going to move her slightly out of the way. You also need to consider there's a doorbell that's right on the side. Uh, is she in scale to proportion to that doorbell? If I'm her, I am slightly, she, it looks like that the top of that doorbell thing is right about her chin height. Well, is that where a doorbell thing is? In your experience, close your eyes, where's the doorbell, right? If it's got names on it, it's not down at your waist. You don't get down like this and look at the door guy. It's not up above you. You're not looking like fucking way up there in the side, whatever. You're looking kind of right here. It's pretty much where it is. And so that's scaled pretty close to where it is. Does that sort of make sense? So I feel like she's scaled about right. In my case, looking at it now and the door and relative to everything else, I think she's still a little bit too big. So again, I'm going to go back to command T. I'm going to click on the link between width and height, and I'm going to make her just slightly lower. If you want the exact same uh, value that I've got, you can type in in your width and height. They should be the same numbers, 52.35%. That's what mine is. And say OK to that. So this scales her right now, but now I want to put her more into the middle of the street. So I'm going to double click on my hand. I can now scale in proportion. I can actually transform in perspective, which is what I'd like to do. I'm going to hit Command H to bring back my um, uh, um, uh, horizon line. But now you see the problem that we've got. If we pull out a second horizon line, which is her horizon line, it goes right through her eyes. And you can see these are not the same. This girl was not shot in the same perspective as this street. Now, in a perfect world, they would be able to match because in order for this to match, the girl should be on the horizon line of the street, which means I'm mean, going to the V key to move the girl. And I'm going to drag her down so that her eyeballs are actually right on the horizon line of the street. But there's no way. Look at how small she becomes relative to the door. She's now, you know, two and a half feet tall. She's a doll. They're not in perspective and they never will be in perspective. So at this stage of the game, we cannot use scaling in perspective. We don't have, we can't do it based on her. We can't do it based on her eyeballs. We can't, do, we can't use either of the horizon lines. To use the one of the city scene is just as bad as using hers. And you would think, okay, well, let's split the difference. We'll put a horizon line in the middle. That will not work either. You basically have to just guess and eyeball this part. So I'm going to hit Command Z to put her back by the door. Uh, I'm going to get rid of these horizon lines because they're not helping me. I know now that there's a mismatch here and there's nothing I can do about it. To get rid of the horizon lines, come up to the view menu, down to guides, down to clear guides, and it will just get rid of them. What I do know is, is that I can move her directly 
right and left without needing to change perspective at all. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit the V key to get the move tool. I'm going to hold down the shift key so that when I move her to the left, she will not either go up or down. Holding down the shift key restricts your movements to either left and right or up and down. It, don't, it won't allow you to do both at the same time. So I'm going to click and I'm going to bring her right out into the middle of the street. And I'm feeling pretty good about that. I do want to bring her closer to me. So I am going to transform her to do it somewhat in perspective. I'm just going to accept her perspective, meaning I'm going to leave the anchor point right where it is. So Command T will actually bring up the transform dialog box. Typically, if I was going to scale in perspective, I would move this anchor point onto a horizon line. It's actually pretty close to the horizon line of the city scene, but again, that doesn't matter. I know this is wrong anyway. I'm going to click on the link between width and height, and I'm actually then simply going to, because uh, that will do this in perspective, and I'm going to simply make her a little bit larger to actually do that part right here. And I'm going to leave it at that part right here. So I made her now, if again, you want the exact same numbers, I've got her now at a 67.29%. And you can see she's taller, but she's also closer to the camera, which makes sense. So the door is now further behind her, and the fact that she is too tall for the door would again make sense because she's closer to the camera and bigger. Is everybody good on this part? Okay, first things first. The lighting. Is the lighting on the girl and the lighting on the figure, I mean the figure and the background the same? Sometimes I just can't get exactly what I want, so what do I do? Uh, use your arrow keys and it'll tap it in one at a time. It'll move it uh, just small, small increments at a time. Is the lighting the same? No, the lighting on the girl's coming from the right. The lighting, main light in the image is on the left. So the girl needs to be flipped or the background needs to be flipped. I'm going to flip the girl. So the girl is selected. I'm going to come up to the edit menu, down to transform, and down to the bottom of transform, flip horizontal. That'll just turn her the other way. And now the street light is actually matching the light that's hitting the side of her face. Are we good on this part? Okay. So after all of that, the part that we've been waiting for. We're going to run check layers on this. So come over to your actions palette. Again, you're not selecting the set. You're selecting the very top of the parent group, the word that just says check layers. Click on that to make it highlighted and then click on the little arrow at the bottom of the actions palette that points to the right and it will run your check layers and you should end up with solarized girl. Are you clicking on the very top parent? Yeah. That should not happen. So this is the top parent, right? So check layers, and then I click this, and then it does this. Yeah, there's something wrong. We need to reload your check layers. So hit cancel out of all of that. Go back in history to get rid of all of this. Or just throw the check layers away. Good. And then let's just reload them. So go up to actions. Go to your check layer set. Click on the set. Throw it away. Perfect. And then go back to the window to the flat menu. We're going to load actions, navigate to this, click on the layer set, mm -hmm. say OK. Perfect. And then click on check layers once and run it. Okay, so this starts off just by default the way the image, the way the action ends is it's got the color on. We don't want to start with color. We're going to actually start with uh, luminosity. So turn off, if you look over into your layers palette now, at the very top, there's a, a group called color check layers. It's because it's not only the color, there's a huge saturation adjustment in there to make this more visible to see. 
turn off the eyeball next to the group and come down and turn on your luminosity check layer. It'll make your image black and white and you can see the uh, immediate mismatch in this. The girl is way too light for this scene. So to fix her, the first thing we need to do is run a luminosity. We need to change the luminosity of the girl alone. So come down and select the figure, because remember, every uh, adjustment that we make now, we need to clip to this figure. So i am selected the figure. I'm going to add an adjustment curve to this. So click on, again, at the very bottom of your layers palette, the icon that's half, the circle that's half black, half white. Click on that, come up to add a curve to this. Immediately, we need to clip the curve to the uh, figure so that it only impacts the figure. It doesn't impact your entire image. So if you look at your properties panel, there is actually a little icon at the very bottom of it that's got a square with an arrow pointing down. If you click on that, that will actually do the clipping for you. If you click on it again, it will unclip this. The other way to do it is to hover right between the two layers, right between the figure layer and the curve. Hold down the option key and your cursor will change to that same square with an arrow going counterclockwise. Click and that will actually clip it to the image. So now what happens is that as you change your curve, it only impacts the girl. It doesn't impact the entire image, which is what we want this to do. Now, a lot of people when they look at this say, well, clearly the girl needs to be made darker and every one of you has been taught to actually grab the center of the curve and drag it down. And the problem with that is, is that it makes the midtones of the girl darker, it makes the shadows darker, but it doesn't do a damn thing for the highlights, which are where the problem is. The highlights are still anchored up here at the very top. This is not how you actually do this. So I'm going to tear that point off. Instead, you grab the point that is actually the highlight point in your properties panel at the very top. You grab that point and you start dragging straight down and stay to the right. You don't want to come in to the left. Look what happens to my curve right here. If I bring this in, it completely changes things. Again, you want to stay to this far right side over here, but you want to drop this thing down to the point that you feel like she is actually tonally matching this background. And for me, I come way down. I've got, if you look at your input output numbers right here, I've got an output of 155. I've brought her highlights down to almost middle gray. Did this work for everyone? Now again, once we recolor this and do the saturation, I may have to revisit this. It may be a little too dark, it may be a little too light. I don't know where that is yet. This is a cumulative process among all of them. Make sense? Okie dokie. So the next thing I'm actually going to do on here, I'm, so I'm gonna turn off my luminosity check layer version of this. The next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to shoot for the color without uh, actually using my color check layers. I'm actually going to use the method that I've actually just built by grabbing the color swatches and doing all of that. I'm going to do that first, and then if I need to fine tune it, I can actually fine tune it. So this is the reason we've done all of this work up until now. So come up to your, we need to get the swatches back. Come up to your window menu and come down to swatches. It'll actually open up a dialog box. I'm gonna set mine over to the side. I need to be able to get to these swatches, but I wanna be able to see my figure. I wanna be able to work with other things here. So I'm just moving it over to the side so I have access to it. Again, I don't need <clears throat> my info palette right now. I don't need any of those sorts of things right now. I'm good with what I've actually got. So I'm gonna come back and I'm going to select the luminosity adjustment layer. And the reason I'm selecting this is that I'm going to add my color on top of this, but I also need to clip my color correction to it. So the color correction either needs to be on top of this uh, uh, adjustment layer or underneath it. it. They all need to ultimately touch, for lack of a better way of putting it, the figure layer. So I'm going to add another adjustment layer on top of this, and this gets a little tricky. So if you take a look at your possible adjustment layers, you have gradient map and you have gradient at the top. 
we are going to do a gradient map, not a normal gradient up at the top. So you want to select gradient map. And it'll actually open up, and in my case, my image turned yellow, in part because my foreground color was a yellow. But we don't need to worry about that part. But in your properties panel, you've actually got a gradient that sits up at the very top. It's a preview of it. This also allows us to edit this gradient, which is what we're going to do. If you double click on that gradient, it will actually open up the gradient editor. And I'm going to stop right here to make sure that everybody is this far. So everybody has the gradient editor up. OK. So the rest of this part becomes relatively simpler. So what a gradient map does is it actually looks at tones in your image and it allows you to map other tones to it or colors to it as well. And that's what we're going to do. We are going to rebuild this gradient mapping based on the color palette that already existed in the night scene of our image. So to do that, you'll notice in my case, again, don't worry about whatever your color is, but what you should have in here is you should have two stops. These are what these things are called, at least two stops, and that's, you don't need anything more than that. Does anybody have more than two stops down here? These little color things? Okay. So this is how it works. We are going to select the color of the first stop. So this always happens on the ones that are underneath. Click on the color stop color and it will actually then change the color. You'll see down at the bottom here to a color picker. You need to click on that, which will open up the color picker. And then you need to come over to your swatch and pick the darkest color. We are going to go from dark on the left to light on the right. So you need to click on that and that will actually change the color of that gradient to the color that came from your night scene. Did that work for everyone? At this stage of the game though, you also need to look at the location and you'll actually, I take it back, not look at the location. You need to look at the brightness of your image right here. The brightness in this color picker, it says a brightness of two, that's almost zero. But anyway, this brightness of two is where that color falls on the scale of zero to 255. So you just need to remember that number. I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. And then in the location, I'm typing in two. That's where that color belongs on my color mapping scale. Don't worry, we're going to do this for everybody else as well. So now I'm going to do my brightest color. To do that, go to your brightest color hover underneath the color stop click on it it will change your color down to the bottom to whatever color was already in there in my case it's white click on the color the word color at the very bottom and the color picker dialog box will open up you need to now click on your lightest color which is that uh, yellow so I'm going to click on that. It loads the yellow as that color, and it gives me a brightness of 95%. I'm going to say OK to that, and then type in 95 for my location. This is now mapping not only color, but brightness. Where does that color live? Is everybody still with me? OK. We need to add three more stops. Yes. It just crashed. Yeah, I saved it before, right before we did the gradient. Okay, you should be good. Uh, if you've got Chrome running, quit it now. It'll help. Actually, quit Chrome. Don't just close the windows. Yeah, and yeah, and your gradient map, you can actually pitch your gradient map because it changes to black and white. You can also pitch, uh, yeah, leave your curve. So again, adjustment layer, gradient map. Perfect. Uh, and then just click on the gradient editor. And then uh, show your swatches again. 
perfect, and we'll do your adjustment first. So click on that first slot. No, click on that guy. Click on that guy. Click on the slot spin. Perfect, and you'll see it says two on there. So click on that guy. Click on that guy. Click on that guy. Okay, so to add color stops, you simply put your cursor underneath the gradient map line, the editor line. It doesn't matter where you put it down here because when you type in the location value, it's going to move it. So I'm just going to click on a spot down here. Again, it gives me a color, a, a color stop with a color. I'm going to click on the color picker. And now I'm going to do my next lightest color uh, in the darker of the groups. I've already got my shadow one. I'm going to the next lighter one. It's still very dark. I'm going to click on that. That gives me a color sampler. Uh, it is the color. I make a note of the brightness. It is 15. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. And in my location, I'm going to type in 15. I'm going to then click in another stop to click on to get another stop sort of more in the middle. I'm going to click on my color picker to bring it open. I'm going to then use the color sampler tool to pick the middle of my colors that I picked up from my uh, uh, from that I uh, exported. Uh, I'm going to again look at its brightness percentage, which is 45. So that's where my location is. I'll type in 45. I'm going to add another color stop as I'm moving sort of towards my lighter parts right here. Again, I'm going to click on the color sampler tool and I'm going to go to my last one, the fourth stop. It's a, that sort of middle tone one. Um, it's got a brightness of 65, so I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And it actually landed right at 65, so I was really good about that part of it all. And this is now my new color gradient, and I'm going to say OK to that. So. Two things that we need to do here, because this is impacting my entire image. So I'm going to close up my swatches. First thing I'm going to do that I realize I did not do is I'm going to go back to my curve that's actually controlling the luminosity. I'm going to select that and change its blending mode from normal down to luminosity. That makes a huge difference. Then I need to clip this gradient to the figure. So again, the gradient is sitting, the gradient map is sitting just above my luminosity correction. So I'm going to hover between those two um, layers, hold down my option key, clip to clip the gradient to the girl. She is clipped to, to that. I then need to change the gradient map blending mode from normal to color. And then finally, as a tweak in all of this, I need to drop the opacity till I feel like that this girl, because it's, it's overcolored her. She's too, I mean, she's just, she's taken on too much of that color. So I'm simply going to back the opacity of my gradient map off so that I feel like she is really in that space color wise. And in my case, it's dropped down to about a 73-ish in there, somewhere in that range. Looks about right to me. Everybody good on this part so far? Okay, the last thing I want to look at really quickly is my saturation checker. So click on the saturation check layer. And again, what happens in saturation, and you can sort of see it going on in here, is, is that the brighter something is, the more saturated it is. So if you remember, the, the light areas that are on the wall are that really hypersaturated uh, yellow. Um, uh, the areas that are down here in the shadows have no saturation in them all, so they're actually very dark. The girl itself right now is matching the scene somewhat well. She seems a little flat to me, though. She's a little bit, I, she should be a little bit lighter than all of this. 
this. I think some of the stepping on, on some of the um, uh, um, uh, uh, luminosity on this has actually changed that a little bit. So before I actually do my saturation check, I'm going to go back to my luminosity check and make sure that I still feel good about this luminosity. And when I get to the luminosity part, her face seems a little bit dark to me relative to where I think these lights are hitting her, how that would all be. So I'm going to go back to my curve and I'm actually going to lift it just slightly. I'm going to make her just a little touch brighter. I feel like that's a better shot on that. I'm going to turn off my luminosity check layer. I feel a little bit better about that part. So I'm going to run my saturation check layer again. Again, I think she needs just a slight pop in saturation. She needs a little bit more. So I'm going to select my gradient map layer because remember, all of my adjustments need to be clipped to the girl. So I'm going to go to my adjustment uh, gradient map and I'm going to add a hue saturation layer above that. I'm going to change the blending mode of that hue saturation layer to saturation and I'm going to clip it to the gradient map so that they are all just impacting the girl. And then I'm going to actually bump the saturation up slightly. She should get a little bit lighter. And she does. So I ended up with a plus 11 in my saturation if you guys want to be the same. <clears throat> I'm going to turn off my hue saturation check layer. And this is actually beginning to work for me now. I feel like her coloring is actually much closer to what this should be. To do a tweak on this, a final check on this, let's go ahead and turn on your color check layers, the adjustment part. And you can see now how well or not she actually matches the scene. Remember, what we're trying to do is with this is have the feeling that she fits this whole scene. If we come down and you turn off your gradient map, you can see the difference what this gradient map has actually done. It's massively shoved this into the direction of the surrounding scene because it's all based on that color. You don't ever want to try to do this using a color balance adjustment layer. Is this making sense to everybody what's going on? Are we good on this part? Okay, we need to gild the lily right now. Uh, I'm going to turn off my uh, color check layer parts. So, two tricks that we need to do for this really quickly to finish up our sort of composite is I want to anchor her into her space. So I'm going to go all the way down. I need a shadow underneath her. I'm going to go all the way down to my background layer. Uh, I'm going to add a blank layer above that. I'm going to hit the G key to get the gradient tool. I'm going to hit the D key to default my foreground and background colors to black and white. Up to the very top, I'm going to kick on my drop down menu for the type of gradient that I'm using. I'm going to open up my basics panel and make sure you've got the middle one selected, which is foreground color to transparency. That's why you see the black going to the checkerboard foreground to transparency. Uh, you can, to get that dialog box to close up again, simply click on the area up near the word Adobe. Then need to make sure that on the icons that are on the very top for the type of gradient that you want, we want a circular gradient. It's the second icon from the left. They call it a radial gradient. Then I'm going to just, uh, um, uh, again, I've got my blank layer already above. It's above the background, but underneath the girl, which is critical for us. I'm going to double click on that name and I'm going to call it shadow. One. Say OK. Then over in my frame, because again, I've got the gradient selected, I'm going to click and drag down. It'll actually give me a circular gradient that's going from black to transparent. Command T will bring up the transform dialog box. I need to then crush this gradient so it's more flattened. It's not a circle. I want a pancake. So I'm going to grab the control handle that's the very top. I'm going to hold the option key so that when I move the very top handle, it also moves the bottom handle. So I'm compressing this gradient from both the top and the bottom. If you don't hold down the option key, it will only compress with the handle you're using. So again, I'm going to hold down the option key, click and flatten this out. I'm going to click and drag this underneath her. 
it seems pretty good. It's a little wide. Sure, shadow would not be that wide. Also, the light is coming from the left-hand side, so I'm going to shift the entire gradient over towards the right side so that it looks like more of a shadow is being thrown on the right side. I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. Now, I've got a darker part of the shadow on the right-hand side. I've also got a little bit of shadow that's on the left. At this stage of the game, I'm going to go to my tablet because that's what I use to do all of my shadow work. I'm going to hit the E key to get the eraser tool. And again, the eraser tool, I need to, there, sh there would be no shadow of her on her left-hand side because the light is on the left-hand side. There is a lot of shadow on her right-hand side, but on her left-hand side, there should be no shadow. So working on my shadow part, I'm simply going to erase that part. However, there needs to be a much darker, deeper shadow that's right underneath her. So I'm going to add another new layer to this to make a shadow number two. And say OK. Hit the G key to get a gradient. Click and pull it out. Command T to transform it. Hold down the Option key and flatten this. Move the darker shadow that's right underneath her. I'm going to also tighten it up. Sorry. And push it back a little bit. And accept that part. And then I'm going to fade it back a little bit. It's a little too dark. So I'm going to drop it down to like an 80, something like that. That's feeling pretty good about the shadowing neath underneath her. If we want to take a look at the before and after that, I can turn them both off and then back on. You can see it very it grounds it to her. But the last thing that I need to do on this, it doesn't really explain what's going on here in terms of, 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 of what's happening on her, the light that's actually on her. She's basically flat lit and she needs to be top lit. So what I need to do is I need this whole thing to fade from her down. I need her lower part of her skirt to be darker than the upper part of her skirt. So that's what I'm going to go after next. In the next part, I'm going to go back up because this needs to be on the girl, but not on the background. So I'm going to go back up to my top adjustment layer. It was the hue saturation layer that I put up on the very top because this next layer also needs to be clipped to this girl, right? So I'm going to add another blank layer on top of that. It's just going to be a regular layer. Uh, I am going to clip it, so I'm going to hold down the uh, uh, my Option key and click on it so it clips over. I'm going to call it Darken Skirt, or Darken Dress, and say OK to that. I'm going to change the blending mode of this to Luminosity. Again, I don't want to shift in color. And then I'm going to hit the B key to get a brush. I'm going to make it a completely soft brush. The blending mode is going to be normal, 100% opacity, 100% flow. Black is my foreground color, and you want to make your brush as big as you can get it. I'll show you what I'm looking for here. So again, I've got a very soft brush here. What I'm really looking for here is I want the middle of my brush to be at the bottom of her skirt because again the middle of my brush is going to be its darkest as i move up to the edge the brush is a soft brush it's going to get lighter and lighter and lighter so you want to set the middle at the bottom where her feet are but then you want to make the brush big enough to go to where you think the fall off should start happening. And I think the fall off should start happening right underneath her boobs. So this is the size brush. I'm going to make it just a little bit bigger. This is the size brush that I'm going to do. Again, at this stage of the game, you want to do one single dot. Just do a tap. If you're doing your mouse, that's fine. Just do one click. And it will actually make things considerably dark. 
but they're clipped to her. This is exactly what I'm looking for. It's actually really dark at her feet and then going up, fading up to her dress. The only issue here is it's too strong. So you simply take the uh, opacity adjustment of this layer and kick it back to the point that you are happy with how it works. So I'm getting this one back here a little bit. I'm feeling pretty good about what's happening on her hands, but the skirt itself at the bottom still needs to be darker. So I'm going to do another one of these layers. Again, I'm gonna simply click on another one. I'm gonna hold down the option key to clip it. I'm gonna call it darken bottom dress. And I'm going to do the very same trick, but this time, again, I'm going to put the center of my brush at the, her feet, but this time the brush is much smaller. Sorry. Uh, the brush is much smaller. What is going on here? Hang on one second. Be right there. Let me just save this before I lose it. Okay, shoot. Oh, you ran that by me again? Yes. Well, because in that area right now, it's already black on the brush, but I've pulled the opacity back to let the top be where the top should be. So it gives me independent control of them. Okay, so it's clipped down to the bottom. Again, I'm going to change that to luminosity only, make my brush even smaller. Because again, the way I'm seeing it now, it's really going from basically her hands to the bottom of the dress. And then again, I'm gonna click once to make that darker and then drop its opacity till I feel like this thing looks correct. I'm going to double click on the hand, and this is where I'm at. Yeah, for last week's assignment, I just used the input gradient tool to do this. Fine. Yeah. It, whatever works. Okay. Sure. Does this make sense? Where are we going here? Everybody good on this part? So then again, at this stage of the game, we could consider tweaking other things here if you felt like Oh, does she seem like, um, again, I, I, I'm worried that maybe I keep pushing that uh, highlight down a little bit too much on her. So I'm going to go back to my luminosity check layer, not check layer, my luminosity control, and I'm going to lift the highlights just a little bit. That feels like a little bit hotter on her face. That works for me. And so, and that's it. That's my composite. I know, <laughs> sick, right? I mean, think about where we came from. This. That to that. All right. Say what? <laughs> you need one, right? Yes, we'll do a quick break. 10 minutes, it's five after, quarter after, we got a lot to get through. All of this was supposed to have been done last week. It is what it is.